Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh and today we're going to talk about how to tell if something is aromatic. So we're going to play the game. Is it aromatic or not? Okay, so really what we need here is we need criteria to determine aromaticity, right? And indeed that has already been figured out for us. For a compound to be aromatic, it has to fulfill two things. One is that the compound must exist in a ring. Okay, so it must contain a ring. Compound must contain a ring. Okay with continuously overlapping p orbitals. In order, other words, you have to have the alternating single and double bond configuration that we talked about with benzene, where you have um, single and double bonds and the p orbitals orient outside of or perpendicular to the ring I should really say and that those p orbitals then overlap all the way around much like conjugated dienes do. But conjugated dienes are often talked about as flat um, things, flat or uh, chains, long n chains is what we talk about them as, not as rings. So this is adding a ring piece to it. The other thing is that the number of pi electrons, second thing, the number of pi electrons in the ring must be a Huco number. Okay, so Huco, Huco, maybe I should say, had this theory that the number of pi electrons allowed in an aromatic ring had to be 4n plus 2, which gave us numbers like if 4 is 1, well actually if, if 4 is 1, sorry. <laughs> if n equals 0, let's start there, then you would have two pi electrons in the ring. If n equals one, then there would be six. If n equals two, then you would have 10, so on and so forth, right? Until quite plausibly infinity, infinity although I haven't found an organic molecule like that, right? So when, that, when they're talking about that, that's the number of electrons in the ring that are overlapping, in, uh, overlapping continuously uh, in this pi electron um, bond. There you go. <laughs> it's been a long day, sorry. Okay, so having said that, let's talk about what happens if violations occur, okay? If a compound violates that one, if number one is violated, so in other words, if num number one is untrue, then it doesn't matter whether it has four n plus two electrons, it's non-aromatic. Okay, so if number one is violated, the compound is non-aromatic. If it violates, if number two is violated, and what we're assuming here is that if number two is violated but number one is not, right, so number one is true, then the compound is what we call anti-aromatic. Okay, so, and usually anti-aromatic compounds have 4n pi electrons instead of 4n plus 2. So that's the difference between them. Okay, having said that, let's evaluate some aromatic compounds versus not and see whether we can figure out whether they're aromatic 
non-aromatic or anti-aromatic. All right. Now that I've erased my criteria, you're going to need to remember that in our notes. All right, if it's a ring, has overlapping P orbitals, but does not have a Huckel number. And we'll talk about why the Huckel number is so important in terms of this. It actually, the best explanation I've seen is with frost circles. For why that 4n plus 2 works so wonderfully. I need to erase this faster. Woo! Let's erase this much and then see where we go from there. <laughs> My arm is already tired from erasing. And it's not even done yet. Okay, so here's this. Okay, so let's talk about, like, for instance, benzene, right, with its overlapping. We know the benzene is aromatic, but that's confirm it. Let's do cyclooctatetraene. Isn't that interesting? All right. And then let's do perhaps like this one. And just see if we can figure out if this is working or not. Versus uh, maybe, uh, oh, we got all kinds of compounds here. All right, can you see all of those? You can see all of those, great. Okay, so to be, uh, to be aromatic, you have to have a ring that contains overlapping p orbitals. All of these are rings with overlapping p orbitals. The difference between these is gonna be between aromatic and anti-aromatic. So what I'm gonna look at is I'm just gonna count the number of pi electrons in the ring, okay, contributing to the ring. So I have pi electrons there, pi electrons there, and pi electrons there. This has three lines drawn, which means six pi electrons, All right? Does that work with the Huckel number? 4n plus two? Yes, it does, so this is aromatic. Okay, now in terms of these, these extra lone pair electrons are gonna usually be p orbitals. So this is still overlapping electrons. This lone pair is still an overlapping p orbital, but we need to find out whether it abides by Huckel's number or not. So for 4n plus 2, if I count these as part of the pairs, then I have 2, or part of the pi electrons, I have 2, 4, 6. I have 6 pi electrons. Yep, that's aromatic as well. Awesome. Let's do this one, right? It has overlapping single and double bonds. It's in a ring. We need it to abide by 4n plus 2. So I have 2, 4, 6, 8 pi electrons. That doesn't abide by 4n plus 2. It abides by 4n. So this is anti-aromatic. which is awesome to know. All right, let me erase a little bit more here so that you can actually see my anti-aromatic compound. Woo, all right. Anti-aromatic. All right, and here, again, the lone pair is gonna contribute. So we have two, four, six, eight, that's eight pi electrons. Okay, so that is, again, 4n, so that is anti-aromatic. 
Now the question is, why does equals number exist and why does it work? Well, the reason for this really has to do with uh, frost circles. That's, frost circles are not to do with this. It really has to do with MO theory, molecular orbital theory, and how that works. But frost circles are a really easy way to see if that'll work. Because basically what Huckel was saying was that the uh, pi electrons that exist in that ring have to exist in bonding orbitals. If they don't exist in bonding orbitals, if they exist in anti-bonding orbitals or non-bonding orbitals, then suddenly we have something that's anti-aromatic. So what we need for the frost circles is first off, here's kind of the steps. One, step one, you're going to draw a circle. <laughs> My circles suck. There's my circle. OK, two, you're going to inscribe a polygon in that circle. A polygon. Whatever your polygon is that your cyclic, um, your ring, your cycle, is a polygon. So this is inscribe a ring. This is the equivalent of saying inscribe the ring in the circle, making sure that one of the points of the polygon is at the bottom, is at the very bottom of the circle. Um, one point must be at bottom of circle. Boy, I got a squeaky marker. I am sorry. All right, so I'm going to take my same circle here and I'm going to inscribe a polygon. Let's do Oh, that really didn't turn out the way I exactly wanted it to. Ooh, let's do this instead. Whee! <laughs> It takes some work to work out the polygon moments. All right, and I did this kind of crappy, actually, for several reasons, not the least of which is that it should be symmetrical, right? <laughs> it should be a symmetric polygon. So that it should be about there that this comes. So that should be like that. Oi. Oi, there you go. All right. It's not easy circumscribing a circle around a polygon, but I'm going to do my, do my best here. And this obviously comes with time. Oh, that's close enough. All right. This doesn't have to be perfection. It just has to be close enough. All right. So now what you're going to do is you're going to put horizontal lines at each of the places where the vertices of the polygon hit the circle. So in other words, the points of the polygon where the points of the polygon hit the circle. So like for instance here, there's a point that hits the circle and this should be the same level opposite. That's why it has to be symmetrical. Draw, draw, draw a horizontal line everywhere a point hits the circle. And that should be a little bit higher, but there you go. Okay, so three, draw a horizontal line Everywhere, every time the ring has a point that hits the circle. That connects with the circle. Oh, you guys can't see this. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, you can see that it's connecting with the circle. All right, so you get the idea there. Okay, so that's awesome. And then for, let me erase some of this. So you get a sense of what four and five are. There's five steps to this total. So if we can get through those five steps, life is good, all right? The fifth step is that you're going to draw a horizontal axis straight through the middle of your circle. 
So basically, you're going to hit the diameter of the circle, but right through the middle of the circle. Draw a horizontal axis. OK, so what is that going to look like? I'd say that my horizontal axis is right there, right? OK, that's in terms of energy. So if I put an energy diagram here, what's interesting about this is that everything below this axis is going to be lower energy, right? So lower E, and there is therefore a bonding orbital. Everything above it is a higher energy, right? It has higher E, and it is therefore an anti bonding molecular orbital, right? So the last steps, right? So four, draw a horizontal line through the center of the circle. And then everything from there on out is erasing. Erase, polygon, and circle. All right, so let's see if I can do this. Erasing the polygon and the circle. It's not going to be perfect. You're going to forgive me. But this is incredibly, what's really nice about this is that it's incredibly close to where the actual molecular orbitals end up being. You may need to rewrite the lines a little bit. But that's the frost circle idea. So in this case, notice that this is an antibonding orbital. 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 All starred. These would all be p pi electrons, by the way. So this would be pi star for those of you who are like, this would be pi with no, um, no star by it, because stars designated antibonding orbitals. And you'll notice that below the line here, in a seven-membered ring, there are six. Uh, there are three lines that are that are bonding orbitals. Let me say this right: three lines with bonding orbitals. Right? There's four lines with anti-bonding orbitals. Which means that if I filled each of these lines, remembering that two electrons go in each line, this could gra have a grand total of six pi electrons, which is a equal number. And that's where that comes from. It's kind of a cool process. It helps you understand why the stability works. And it gives you a handy little moment for the actual molecular orbitals. All right, fun stuff. Practice on these until I see you next time. Adieu.